Hi, I'm Chris from Air Windows, and what I'd like to do today is try to run you through some of the new things in um, Iron Oxide 4. Iron Oxide was the first tape uh, plugin that I came up with uh, some years ago, and although it's been supplanted by uh, two tape as far as realistic tape emulation goes, there are some things that Iron Oxide does which are significant in that you don't necessarily always want literally a tape emulation. Sometimes you might want something that works more like a bandpass or whatever. Now iron oxide is not specifically a bandpass. It involves saturation and the uh, bandpassy type elements are not implemented in the way that you would implement a normal EQ filter. But um, Essentially, I've come up with something new to do with this stuff, and that's because one of my users asked me to incorporate a wet-dry control, because they were like, I'm routing things to two different buses, can't you make this simpler for me? Well, as you probably know, uh, Reaper already does that. Reaper includes the capacity to run wet-dry on all plugins as a matter of course. Logic does not. But there was something new that I figured out that I could do involving this control. And I'll show it to you here. This is bypassed. Um, here we have iron oxide 4. And we've got the input trim. And highs and lows tape speed basically shows you where the um, bandpassy type elements are going to work out like the lowest tape speed if that goes up to a high high um, simulated speed like 150 eeps that would be a very little low frequencies left for instance if you put it to 30 then you're going to be losing some lows much like when you're running 30 eeps tape rather than 15 i'm going to look like a complete fool if you're not supposed to pronounce it eeps i don't care um, flutter is also a thing I'll be able to demonstrate that later. That's That uh, came into play with Iron Oxide 3. Output trim and input trim are just what you'd expect them to be. But here is the new feature, which is Inf Dry Wet. Inf stands for inverse. Let's get a sound going. Now that's the, the basic sound. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to manage mixing um, dry in with uh, the microphone recording that I'm also getting. Possibly I will just crank my levels way down and do it that way. Um, or use some kind of ducking or something. I will try to be talking over this, but it's going to blend in an interesting way. Now here's the thing. If I turn on the tape device. You can hear it's a little more bandpassy and that I can overdrive it. You can also hear that if I overdrive it, if I cut the trim down and then start blending in dry, this is what I was asked for. But there's another trick that we can do with this. Since the, um, the overdrive, and you notice I have a, um, a bandpassy kind of thing, I can exaggerate that. For instance, if I had the highs very low, it just cuts the highs out completely. And if the lows are very high, that cuts the lows out completely. Now I've got this voiced to a sort of obnoxious mid-range area. We'll dial it back until we're getting a certain amount of overdrive, but not lots, and um, pull the output trim right down. This is for a reason. Here's what happens when I go to inverse. We're subtracting rather than adding the wet signal. 
that means it's going to cancel out. But since it is not a um, generic digital EQ, it'll have an unusual characteristic. And since it's an overdriven bandpass, what's essentially going to happen is we'll be canceling out some of these mids, and when the uh, overdrive kicks in, we'll be stopping this cancellation as the overdrive starts to happen. So the result ends up becoming a sucked out sound, which I'm really taking out this mid-range area. But it still pokes out where the high frequencies or the, the mid-range frequencies that we're using kick through and the source, um, the uh, iron oxide signal is distorting. That means you get that back. This is also a place where you can hear what the flutter does. plainly hear that that gets a little weird. You can uh, make it be more extreme also. Cutting the flutter down to zero makes it become more like a bandpass. And again, we're doing this inverted thing. We can also voice it down into the low mids, for instance. So we can have punch in the low mids, but also be sucking them out, kind of like what you would do with the bass drum. We've got a number of kick drums in this, so try this. And yeah, that's getting lots of lows. You can sort of zero in on the area in the kick drum that you find annoying. to listen for it a little bit here. Here it was working, but on things like drums or whatever, it's not that obvious, except for in the, the hi-hats and the cymbals. With those, it can become very obvious. And we'll give it a little more output trim. Here's our raw sound. And here's what we get when we start pulling it out and um, doing a mid-cut like one would do in a kick drum. Here, that's uh, got more punchiness to it. We can even go beyond that to uh, get an exaggerated, weirdly cancelled out sound. See, that's punching things up a little bit. And we can also bring the frequency up doing this so that. That's giving us a massive mid-range suck out where it's canceling. And then the uh, inverse signal is so hot that it's actually giving a more sort of general mid-range boost because it's overdriving. But since that's such a hard suck out, um, it doesn't sound especially good. So what we'll do is Let's go back to the fold uh, wet. Push it until that kick drum in there is resonating harder. And then we'll go back to the inverse again.
that's about your full cancellation. You can cut the output trim right down to make it easier to manipulate. So you can hear where the snare is starting to punch in a, pe a peculiar way. And here's our dry. And that's how you can use the new iron oxide 4, which can also serve as your general sort of tape overdrive bandpassy kind of thing. This is how you can use it to do cuts in such a way that the punch and attack still comes through. Like I'll exaggerate that a little bit. And bring a little of the mints back because I've sucked them out awfully hard there. And then I'll throw some flutter in just to make it a little more interesting. It'll give a weird sort of phasey effect. Maybe a little less. Now you can hear that kick drum coming through. And um, it does have a degree of kick to it that is pretty much entirely artificial and imparted by iron oxide form. Compare it with your bypass. You can feel it sort of just... It's really kicking through pretty hard. That's the idea. So that is one of the purposes of owning iron oxide rather than just owning Tutay. People have sometimes criticized me about having multiple different um, effects doing similar uses, but they do have their own purposes. Like, for instance, I can take this, go full wet, and um, push this to the other max and focus in only on the snare drum crack. start going uh, dry wet with this one and this will bring out the bark of the snare and um, two tape doesn't actually do this because this is not really a tape effect anymore it's a crazy sort of bandpassy saturation bark kind of thing but it works that with the bypass. I've also been criticized for liking mid-range bark too much. Maybe that's true, because I like this. And I even like this too. And of course, if you hate the mid-range bark, you can go right to the inverse and start subtracting it. much cleaner, sort of warm and chilled out kind of sound. So, that is Iron Oxide 4. Now, also things I've done with it is, this is the first version of Iron Oxide, specifically to use my um, noise shaping to floating point. Since uh, Iron Oxide 4 does its internal processing 
at 64-bit floating point, you can go directly to the 30-bit, the 32-bit um, output that Logic and most other um, digital audio workstations use. But since it's possible to keep the leftover information from going directly to that, I'm doing a form of noise shaping. You can't actually do dithering to 64-bit floating point, but it turns out you can keep what's left over from the uh, conversion and just sort of work it in. And this is at about a volume level of minus 160 dB or so. So I do not think anybody's going to be blind testing the difference between dithering, uh, noise shaping to 62-bit, 32-bit uh, floating point or not. But um, I do it because it's technically correct. I do it because I like having lots of that stuff. I, I did actually test this out once. I had an entire mix with a whole bunch of different plugins and had thrown in um, temporary versions of all of those with the noise shaping to, to a 32-bit. And I thought I could maybe hear a difference. Um, was enough for me. It, it's a technically correct thing to do, and so it may be mad, rampant overkill, but I don't particularly mind. The idea is that this should be a lush, fluid-sounding effect. Like if you've got it um, going on like this, and then you throw it onto full wet, it should get drier. It should be just as fluid as it was, and I'm pretty sure that has the same dimensionality and um, roundness and depth to it that the dry sandal has. It doesn't go out to the surface of the speakers and stuff. And considering that this is a old, sort of previous generation tape effect, that's kind of useful because it, it behaves as if it is a particular kind of tone coloring that you can throw on. And with a bit of luck, that will become useful. I mean, uh, like I might well say, if you own two tape, then please consider picking up a copy of Iron Oxide in case that proves useful to you or you can find places to put it. And obviously, with these new tricks that it can do, um, it can play a new role. Now, there's no telling whether I'm necessarily going to maybe try to bring similar tendencies into the new version of 2Tape that I'm working on, because I've been asked for a base alignment feature that another plugin has, which apparently is like a shelf. And it didn't occur to me to put in a low cut in a tape plugin that has a head bump behavior on it because I didn't understand how that could be realistic. But using this type of technology, technology, hell, it's just an inverse mix-in, but you can't get that out of your, it's, it's more complicated to get that out of fancy routing in the digital audio workstation. It doesn't have to be that hard when it could be on one knob. Well, the head bump control could have the same thing. And if you subtracted the Air Windows 2 tape head bump, what you would get is a really nothing like a, um, a bandpass filter, because it acts nothing like a bandpass filter. And it would start cutting out extreme lows faster than it cut out anything else. And you'd have that same type of behavior, but with a completely well, with a completely different type of behavior. So, uh, the experiments are underway, but iron oxide, this one, with its much broader range of being able to apply this inverted, or indeed this um, dry, wet, focused behavior, iron oxide is out. So, please support independent development and the person who's trying to bring you all these things by request and pick up a copy if you don't have one. Thanks. Bye-bye.